Good afternoon, everyone. This is the second series of the R Insurance Webinar Series for 2024 by the R Consortium, delivered to you uh, by Benedict Hamburger and myself from Swiss Re. Uh, in, in this series, we are going to cover four topics. Last week, we talked about how we can move our workflow from Excel to programming in R. Today's topic is about how we can move our R scripts into production. And then the next two webinars, they will be uh, delivered by my colleague Benedict on the R performance culture. Uh, as I said before, my name is Georges Bakolukas. I'm uh, an actually working for Swiss Re. And over the last uh, seven, eight years, I discovered programming, which I wasn't it wasn't something that I used to do, and it transformed my my workflow from Excel into R. And now, for the last five six years, I will be working with I've been working with Benedict and other colleagues within Swiss Re for our group chief actually Philip Long, who supports the Atelier program that helps people adopt programming on our day to day. I will briefly pass on to uh, Benedict to also introduce himself, and we will then continue with the webinar. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm happy that you chose to listen to our webinar today. I'm Benedict. Um, I somewhat recently joined uh, George's team and um, also supporting and I guess spreading the joy of R within our company. Uh, maybe in contrast to George's background, I've already started using R in during my studies uh, in a sort of statistics kind of focused uh, degree or a mathematics background. And have also start, um, well, kept on using it during my professional career. So I think what George is going to show today is some relevant examples of what people are doing. So I hand it back over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Benedict. So we got we covered already a little bit of a background. Uh, within Swiss Re, we have around 2,000, a community of 1,000 people working on trying to improve ourselves on communication and programming practices. We now have 500 regular coders. And some of the examples we'll show you today and in some of the subsequent webinars are coming from um, the day-to-day -day experience that we face by trying to help each other. The running example for the last week's webinar and this webinar is uh, about a case where uh, an actuary had to price a product which was the uh, credit uh, balance insurance of a loan or in case of a death or a disability. And the insurer who us as reinsurers, we had to provide some quote for, uh, had around 300,000 policies. They provided the loan amount, the loan duration and the interest rate for each policy. And the first task I actually had to do is to calculate the profile of the sum assured. And this problem is quite familiar to people in the banking sector perhaps or uh, companies that uh, issue loans because it's essentially the amortization of a loan. So last year, last uh, last week, we looked at what we could do in Excel, how that translates into R, and today we'll focus more about how we put this this R uh, work into production. So this is what it looked like last uh, time. We had uh, essentially the runoff of a balance over time by someone paying a specified amount. We would you call it the uh, equivalent monthly installment based on the loan amount determined there and the other percentage, percentage rate. And this is the, the solution of the one case in Excel. And uh, we also talked about things that uh, this can appear on graphical user interfaces, even external. It's not like a complex problem to solve, but it's quite convenient to have a solution. So it's a good as a running example. And where we ended up in last week's webinar, is that we uh, replicate what the spreadsheet does using uh, this amortize function, essentially picking up uh, uh, this amortize, uh, uh, this script, uh, 13 lines of code, 12 lines of code, where we apply the inputs, we do perform some intermediate calculations, we calculate the amortization, the equivalent monthly premium, and we create an amortization function that uh, solves the, the profile and we apply it for 
for each of the time periods from uh, from the start, the loan until the end, and then we have the low, the, the balance in the end of the of the loan. Um, so what we're going to do today, five things. They are quite complex things and quite uh, deserving a, a, a webinar on their own. So we will go through them quite quickly. Um, I hope this is a, a taste of what you could do to productionalize your work in R. So first we will talk about building functions and that way it will allow us to reuse the logic that we have created and abstract away the complexity we uh, this script uh, has created for us. Secondly, we will look how we will iterate over the 300,000 records that we may have in a function programming approach, which will allow us to avoid writing explicit loops. And then we will look at how we could put these functions into packages to share our work with other programmers, how we can expose those functions into Shiny apps to share the insights with non-programmers, like the interface that you saw a minute ago, or how we can expose those functions into web APIs to offer our work as a service to other applications. Um, so uh, starting on with the functions, um, this is uh, almost the same uh, code that you saw at the few slides earlier where we had written a script. The difference is that we have wrapped this into three functions and then we have created uh, this structure with three parts. The first part is the body of the function, which is essentially what we we had. We copy pasted it. The second is the the name of the function. So we can call that function using um, a, a name. And then the third is the the arguments of the function. And now you can actually see here three functions: uh, how we calculate the EMI, how we uh, have a helper for calculating the amortization, and then the amortized function, which also calls upon these two functions, essentially. So the experience, the user, the programmer experience would then be amortize this. And that is uh, the, the concept of abstracting away the, 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 the complexity. Uh, so imagine if you put your work into functions, uh, it might make your code easier to understand. Imagine that you have other things that you're doing on the code and then the amortize is just one thing. So you can say, okay, I decide what amortize is, let's move on. If some of the approach changed, you can update it only once and then reuse it where you are applied. You avoid copy pasting because we are using the same, you are copy pasting only potentially one item rather than the whole script. And it's easier to, to reuse on your work with other projects. If you want to learn more about functions, I would recommend the functions chapter of from the R for Data Science books that will be book that I will be referring to uh, in uh, in a few other places. Um, now uh, I will move to the second topic, which is the iteration with functionals. Essentially, we have created one function. How can we apply this function to three hundred thousand policies? Um, uh, but first, let's uh, create some sample data. So I've used um, a basic uh, script here to create a sample of uh, a thousand policies that I can use for the example. I will skip through that quickly. I put it there for some reproducibility if someone wants to to rerun the examples. So the, the data set that I have created looks like this. We have a customer ID, a loan amount, a policy term, and an interest rate. Um, now, the functionals, what do we mean functionals? Imagine we have a, a vector of values and we want to apply a function iteratively of this vector of, of values. The functionals are doing exactly that. So you are creating a mapping between this input to another input where this function is applied iteratively for each element. It just helps us not to write explicitly a, a, a for loop. It does that for us, this map function. Functional is a concept which is covered in the iteration chapter of the R for Data Science. This is a simple case of, of a functional which has only one vector as input, but we could have two vectors as inputs. And in this case, the two vectors are two individual vectors. You see them all standing on their own. 
or we can have a, a slightly different version of that, which is called parallel map, where these two vectors are part of a data frame. And I'm showing this because this is the case that we have here. We have a data frame with columns that we want to use, the loan amount, the interest rate, and the term. So the function that we have applied, we, we will apply it onto uh, using this PMAP. Um, so if I take this random data set that we created at the beginning and I just create just one record of it and to try to see it. When I created the, the data set, by the way, I intentionally put first the sample example I'm using to make sure that uh, uh, the, the numbers um, tied up. It's always good practice to make sure that you test your, your code as you go through. Uh, so now that looks a little bit complicated. I'll just step in to explain a little bit. Um, so we start with the data set. We take only one record, and then we want to create a new column. And this new column that we create will appear here, which is called amortized loan. And in this column, in this cell, we will host a vector of 36 values, and that makes it a list column. Essentially, what we're saying is that apply the amortize function on three different uh, columns. First to be the loan amount, the second, the policy term, and the third, the third, the interest rate, and store the result into this cell. And because the result is not just a single value, but as you see, the 36 values, one for each month, it's, it's, a, it's hosted as a list. As, as an entry in this list column. If you want to know more about list columns and unnesting, which is the next step we will do in the next slide, there is the hierarchical data chapter in Afro Data Science. So now that I have created that, what I need to do is uh, unnest it. Before I unnest it, I turned it into a data frame. I added the projection month essentially which is one, two, three, four, the month of the that we apply. And now I'm unnesting it. So instead of having one row, I have 36 rows. The other rows are those that are repeated because they apply the same, but this row has the principal beginning of the period values as we amortize the loan. Now that I have solved this for one loan, I need to solve it for all the records. And uh, the way I will, uh, solve all the records would be to uh, 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 to remove the slice. Uh, actually, this has a, a bug here. I had to copy paste a value here that groups is, groups the values by, by row. So uh, we'll update this slide after that. And essentially we run it and then we have 200,000 records that we uh, we have created from the thousand, from the thousand uh, values that we had in the beginning, uh, we can even review it. So this will need to be ad updated once we update the the data set. Uh, I will uh, I will move on to the, the packages section, which is the third section that we we covered today. And uh, so, why do we need to? Why is a good idea to package our work? Uh, so packaging is quite a familiar concept for people working in R. It's the principal way of sharing our code with others. And uh, even if we are not sharing, having a package created for our work is still good enough reason because the package uh, approach in Swiss Re in, in, in R apologies, are, uh, makes it easy for us to document our code and test our code. And we will spend the next few minutes talking a bit more about the documentation and the testing frameworks in R. Uh, it's even bit more valuable when we share with others, of course. Uh, so, uh, but let's see how quick it is to create a package. When I first started uh, learning R, uh, I was quite scared to, to in the notion I will be creating a package because it sounds like a very complicated software engineering task. However, it's it's not really that difficult and most of the uh, workflow has been um, 
uh, automate it away if you want with a couple of helpful packages which are the dev tools and they use this. So for the next uh, few slides, I will be utilizing uh, the work of one of my colleagues, uh, did uh, Tom Bowling, who presented on this topic internally a few months ago. Uh, and I've borrowed the slides from, from, from them. So uh, first you can create the package by using the create package function. And then it comes in with uh, some automated populated uh, metadata, which we will step into discuss a little bit more. Uh, the more important are the description and the namespace. Um, so on the description we put on what the name of the package, what is the version, who authored it, you see Tom's name here, and uh, some other metadata, which I will capture in a, in a bit. So uh, one of them is quite important is the license. So we, we share our work with others and what license are we, are we sharing the work? When we are sharing internally within our organization, it might be something quite simple, don't share outside. Uh, uh, but when you decide to share with outside organization, this is a, a quite big topic that you, you will need to, to consider. Um, uh, the, once we update that, we see that uh, the file has changed. So the other element on the description file is uh, um, if other packages that you use need to be called for for your functions, then this is the place to put them. And uh, R is a collection of uh, packages and then people utilize the work of others. And it's important to have a robust framework of identify which are the dependencies that you use in your package. And uh, the workflow is quite straightforward by using this, use this helper packet with the use packet. And this is the pair, it contains the accumulate function I used previously. Um, then um, the other question that comes next is how do you put your code? Uh, where do you put your code? So typically each function will sit on its own script. Uh, you can use this, use this user and the name of the function that you want to name and the name of the script that you want to name and then the script will be created an empty script and then you can copy paste the function there, which the, this is familiar function that we saw previously. Uh, so the, Development workflow is that you add, you change some code, you load uh, some of the changes using this load all. So the package uh, is updated and then you perform some checks with using this check function. Um, and that will test whether your package is in good shape or any, any errors might come up. Um, uh, now, uh, moving on to the documentation topic, uh, we, when we create a function or some script, we are all invested in this. We remember everything, but if we look at it back six months later, we might not even understand what we did. Or when we share it with others, others might not have the same idea about how to use our function. So it's quite important that we document it. Uh, there are some um, frameworks that make documentation of the functions easy. And one, which one of them is the, one of them is the Roxygen framework. The, and essentially by applying a shortcut, the script we have created before okay, uh, obtains a header with some pre-populated parameter values, which invite us to add descriptions and to add uh, some examples. So if I move on on this example here, I have added a brief description about what this function does and some values that I'm expecting and some example. So by typing that, um, putting the function documentation with the function in the same script. And then when I apply the document function, this being recorded in my file system that I have for this project for the package. And then I, people using R will be familiar that if you add the question mark and the name of the function, you will get documentation. So I get all this, this uh, page that has the documentation. I remember the first time I did that, I felt so happy because I used to see all these uh, help functions published by the packages that I had I have been using. And when I created one, it, it makes you feel that you have accomplished something. I think um, uh, I hope you will experience the same the same feeling I had. Um, 
Now I will move to testing now. Uh, so uh, testing is something that uh, we might be familiar from the Excel, from the Excel world where you need to put some tests to make sure that the, the, the values are, are correct. Uh, this becomes a bit more prominent in programming because uh, quite often we try to correct the bug, but we have to update our, our code. We need to make sure that when we update our future code, nothing breaks because it's quite easy to test everything on day one and then you're happy with your product. But then after six months, a year, you might inadvertently break something by trying to fix something else. So writing tests of your code once you go along to put them into a package, it's a, it's a good practice. Uh, so uh, in R, we use this test that framework again, that uh, in similar function, you, they would uh, use this function uh, package, makes it easy to, to test. You initiate it by, by having the use test that, that creates some appropriate files and uh, which invite you to start uh, copying, uh, to start writing your, your tests. Um, so, uh, then uh, the, 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 the code that uh, you've created creates this function, which is pretty empty. And then we will start this uh, script, which is pretty empty, but then we'll start adding elements there. Uh, so the, the basic text could be whether you expect something to be equal or not. Uh, a more complicated text could, could expect how, what's the length of the, of the value, whether it's the numeric type, I'm rushing through a little bit uh, to make sure that we cover all the topics, but please on the Q and A, see if you have more questions on a specific topic, please uh, uh, please voice the question. Um, generally, the, the checklist that uh, it's good to apply is that, do I get the expected output if I get an expected input? And if I receive an unexpected input, do I get a error handling? Um, message that they can actually address. And this last error handling message comes into the defensive programming concept. Quite often, Aksha is working on our own or a small team. We might not need to put a lot of uh, effort into safeguarding our code. Like everyone knows that, let's say, uh, ages are positive or some other item like this. But when we ship our code to someone else to use, then we have to apply much more defensive. And that's why uh, quite often you hear from programmers saying that, oh, you can only write 10 lines of code every day. Because what they mean is code that can be shipped. So things that don't break because someone puts a negative age on something, right? Uh, whereas usually when we are in an environment of the home team, we might be a bit more uh, relaxed about how many things we test. And essentially what we try to achieve here is a, a continuum between working by yourself or sending something to thousands of others and where do you apply the testing? Um, so uh, so the, the test exactly now, if we write those, this defensive programming, this one line of code became 10 lines of code. And you see most of the code is tests. Um, and we might get a warning and we might have something that someone can follow up. Um, um, we can expect the input and the output. So here are some, some examples. And uh, we can also use the cover our, cover our package that we can check how much of our code is, is checked. It's, it's a code is, is uh, covered with tests. Um, now, the, the final bit before we move to the, move to the Shiny uh, is how you, you, you share the package you have created. Um, one way is within your organization to use uh, a package manager like the post package manager that we use within Swiss Re. And typically you have to build it and then share it and also adhere to any digital governance framework that you have within your organization. If you want to share outside your organization, it becomes uh, much more complicated for, for, for various reasons outside the scope of today, but we can cover it at some other point. Uh, and this is something that uh, uh, other industries like the pharmaceutical industries is quite further ahead from the financial services industry. And we hope with this uh, consortium in the future, uh, uh, insurance companies and other financial services companies could potentially collaborate more on, on this topic. But we also have a lot of issues to solve um, 
about license, about uh, intellectual property and maintenance and liability essentially. So at the moment, sharing your packets within your organization is something that it's it's good thing to do because it uses a number of end user application Excel spreadsheets are might be sprawling in some teams. Uh, now, uh, sharing your packets with another, actually who knows how to go with this one thing, it's a good thing because they can use it. But most often, or quite often, we have to share with people that are uh, not coders, or they are not interested in coding, or they don't have time to code. Uh, the Shiny framework is something that we can apply here. And um, I, will, I will skim through uh, some of these slides, but uh, uh, what I wanted to show you is that the equivalent page that creates a basic Shiny app, it's that long, it's not that big, and it's separated with from a user interface code where essentially we say, instead of typing the numbers, you are clicking it, and numeric inputs and outputs, and some layout, a panel layout, and sidebar panel layout, and main panel, main panel layout, and then you have a server mode where essentially you have the functions and a function that creates a graph and you link the server with the with the user interface. And then you might get something like this, which is basic, but similar to what uh, you would expect uh, to, to see in such application. Uh, you can publish it again. Uh, here we use uh, a positive workbench and we publish it on positive connect internally within our organization, but there are options to publish it externally as well. Uh, usually either clicking on the button or something more complicated. And uh, as an example here, this is not available outside Swiss Re. Someone will uh, follow the link and have the application. Uh, now the final part is Okay, we share it with uh, uh, someone who is not uh, coding, and we share it with someone with coding. How can we share it with a other computer application? And this is where the web APIs come in. This is a, a new area for for actuaries that are exploring, but generally, it's a, it's new area generally within the not very new area as a concept, but like the web APIs have proliferated in the last five ten years, and it's a good opportunity for actuaries to to utilize them because quite often you have to interact with big IT systems, but you, you have your domain knowledge, you can build a solution, how do you latch it into the big IT system? And here you will see the familiar example of the a script. And by using the Plumber framework, essentially you add a couple of lines of code that takes this uh, function and expose it as a web API. And uh, then when you publish it, you are using a familiar a familiar and popular uh, web API framework, which is called Swagger. And then you expose it to another, to, to another uh, application. And the person from the other application will pick up the equivalent parameters that they need to pick up. And then they will be almost like typing in uh, a value to get the result, but instead of having a graphical user interface, there's like the application interface that does that. Uh, and so, if you, uh, if you, if you, here is a, an example from a script. If you run a script and you get the uh, the input, you 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 receive the the output. Uh, and again, you can publish the web API with one click from Posi Workbench if you want, but also there are professional continuous integration, continuous delivery framework like in Azure DevOps that you can use to have a more a more uh, automatic way of, of pushing through some changes. And then again, this, uh, this is published uh, and you can test it here from the terminal uh, with a, someone using, so it's different application to use the uh, web API framework to, to uh, send the request and then get the result. Uh, that was from Swiss Re Perspectives uh, link. Uh, so just to summarize, we can put our code into functions. We can avoid explicitly writing loops using functionals. We can package our code to send it to others 
and improve our robustness, and we can share further with web APIs and, and web apps. And that concludes my presentation. Um, we have uh, we're on the 30 minutes back, but we are we can stay back for for Q and A's. Uh, before I forget, um, if you think that uh, uh, your organization could benefit by joining their consortium, please consider doing so. Um, and uh, I'll just uh, uh, invite my colleague Benedict to join me for the Q&A and potentially um, uh, read them out and, and uh, decide on the order. Okay, sounds very good. Thank you very much for the presentation, George. And um, I guess while other people may be busy writing their questions in the Q&A box, I think we already received one, which I found very good. So we had an anonymous question about whether we have the code that is being discussed today available in a Git or uh, on a repository. And uh, I think very good question. I don't think that we had uh, considered it yet. So, um, I guess from my perspective, um, the slides are available and the recording is available and the slides uh, include all, I think the code as far as I'm aware. But I can understand that uh, particularly with today's presentation could be a bit um, burdensome to tr try to copy paste out the necessary codes in order to yourself. So it's at least something that we should consider and uh, we inform you in one of the upcoming webinars um, when, if and when we can make it possible. Not sure whether George you had anything to add there. I agree. I think we should try to find a way to, to share it uh, either via the R consortium or uh, some other means, but uh, we, we'll get back to you. Thank you for, for the question. Okay, I think we have another um, another question coming in from Ahmed or Ahmed. Thank you for your time. What do you recommend for error or handling errors? Practical, practical tips, as this is one area I'm working on. Uh, I think the, the main thing I recommend is that you write the test as you are writing your code. What happens quite quickly, quite often is someone is writing the code, which is the exciting part, and then they hand over to a more junior colleague or some other person to say, okay, write some tests now. And that reminds me a little bit of you you go to some styling stylish salons to have your salons to have your haircut and then people are preparing then the 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 head uh, stylist comes in, does the haircutting, and then they leave you for someone else. And that doesn't work for coding because what if the person comes in for error handling and testing, they have to change the whole concept afterwards. Or if they are not very good, very experienced, they might not apply the proper checks. Um, so, I, I think yeah. I think that that's the biggest one. But uh, Benedict, I think you please uh, share. So, yeah, yeah, I think a very good question. Also, a good um, a demonstration there from the maybe it is if it's meant from the very practical R perspective, then I think something like the R lang or R lang, so R language, R lang package can be quite helpful. So that has some uh, advanced error handling features with different levels of warnings, errors, and so on. And also, which is very capable of uh, giving users some. Um, helpful um, well, messages on where the error may lie. And I think that's heavily used across the tidyverse. So if you're using like Deplier, you're likely, well, and making an error, which I think happens to all of us, then uh, you're already seeing languages from the Arling package or framework. So that may be a good um, area also to investigate. Thank you, Benedict. The, I think we had a comment from Jill, which is just very good. So I think that's very nice to hear, but uh, maybe um, a question that is more on the organizational um, side from Carmen. Uh, where can I find the slides from the seminar last week? Is that um, something that we've already up? I don't think we have already shared it. The video is going through some editing and I believe it will be available on uh, the uh, on YouTube, but also on the side of the R consortium, uh, and also the slides 
they will be there as well. I believe as soon as this happens, there will be a, a LinkedIn or some other social network platform message that if, if you are following our consortium, you you will get the, the notification. I don't believe we have all shared it already. I can help answer that. Um, it's ah. actually in the our consortium's website and under the webinar um, page, if you scroll all the way down, um, you should see the R insurance series. If you click on that, the recording is already available there. And it's also on YouTube in the R Consortium's um, YouTube channel. Oh, okay, excellent. Uh, I realized we're already there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eliane. My pleasure. Okay. Um, then I think we had another question coming from Miguel. Uh, what package do you recommend for data quality assessment? Um, not quite sure whether you want to Benedict. take that. Yeah, um, I think it's a well, quite a challenging question. And to be honest, um, I wouldn't be exactly aware about a particular uh, particular package that helps you with that beyond, let's say, the broader tidyverse or let's say um, general tools and techniques like using glints or uh, looking at the particular um, columns of data and what values you get and so on. I can imagine that one broad challenge with data quality is that um, it's normally quite specific to your use case. So in some cases, like missing values can be completely appropriate because sometimes you know this value is supposed to be missing. And in other cases, um, it's not, and uh, maybe should have been a zero instead because you want to fill all missing values with zero for some downstream process modeling or whatever you do. So I that's it. so maybe that is the reason why I guess from my practical experience, I've most often seen people um, using existing data manipulation tools or data um, um, assessment tools. Again, like the tidyverse, like the player and uh, tidyr to um, go through their data and uh, check for their specific use cases. And if I add, I think from my experience, from using R for the last few years, most of the time is spent on assuring data quality in the end. I've always written some scripts, put them into functions, create some plots that I can then essentially assemble my own solution using these packages as building blocks. Yeah, thank you very much. I think otherwise we only had another comment from Car Carmen. Well, thank you for, oh, I think there's another one just coming up. Um, so Federica had a question and comment. So I'm interested in the API, API usage for sharing and downloading data. Do you have some resources you can suggest uh, besides Plumber package to explore I guess, APIs in particular related to actual work? Uh, I don't, Benedict, you you have? Web APIs uh, is an area which uh, is quite new to me. Uh, I don't know, mm -hmm. Benedict, do you have any experience? Yeah, so uh, broadly, I think there are probably two, two sides to it. I think on the one hand, uh, as George had kindly highlighted today is the, let's say more deploying or doing the, the data generation part of the API. So you are the person who is um, doing the calculation like the amortization schedule or something and uh, de deploy it uh, somewhere. And um, you're probably very well served with Plumber and the R space there for the moment. Um, I guess the other side is then assuming you know someone else has already deployed this API somewhere and you just want to call it to get some calculation done and get the results. I think uh, there, there's the HTTR or Hitter and in particular nowadays Hitter 2 packages that are very helpful and they have quite extensive vignettes on how you can use these packages to interact with existing APIs. So be it these like examples of internally deployed ones or some public other APIs that you may want to use. And um, for particular actual APIs, that is a good question. Um, what I've personally seen is only, let's say like um, particular 
actual pages that um, um, supply information like, let's say, mortality tables or so. And I think that would then be cases where you can um, use, again, uh, a package or a framework like HTTR or Hitter to, um, to query these APIs and get the data you need. I hope that gets you some idea. Um, other than that, now I don't quite remember the exact source. I'm not sure whether it was advanced R or R for data science, but uh, I'd have to look it up. One of these, uh, at least one of these books also had very good tips on how you can um, use APIs in your data science workflow or your actual workflow. And I think that was the last question we had for now. Thank you very much, Benedict. Uh, I just wanted to, to express that I hope that some of you might be more motivated to start coding, or if you have already started coding, to put in your code into production. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Elenia from our consortium and my colleague Benedict for joining me today. And uh, we hope we'll see you next week or the next couple of weeks that Benedict will provide the performance uh, webinars uh, to continue with the series. And if you have any feedback, please share with us and uh, or any ideas about future topics for webinars for our insurance. I would like to bring the webinar to a close then. Um, so thank you very much from my side. Thank you all. See you. Bye-bye, everyone.